here we are, the minor profits for beginners, majoring in minors. This is lesson number nine, only have one more to go after this, we'll be finished. Lesson number nine, uh, we're doing Zephaniah and Haggai, Zephaniah and Haggai. So today's lesson, we'll be looking at one of the last prophets to minister to the Southern Kingdom before its defeat and its exile, and that would be Zephaniah. And then we're going to look at a man who was called to ministry while living during the Jewish return from exile, and that is Haggai. Haggai grew up while the transfer was taking place from Babylon, the Jews who were coming back to their homeland and to their city. But first we'll talk about Zephaniah. The name uh, Zephaniah uh, means uh, Jehovah hides, or he whom Jehovah has hidden. As we read in his first verse, it says, the word of the Lord, which came to Zephaniah, son of Cushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. So the very first, uh, verse of the book traces Zephaniah's ancestry back four generations. It says he was the son of uh, Cushi, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, or Hezekiah in the King James Version. Since this is the only prophet to trace his ancestry in this fashion, it is generally believed that the Hezekiah that is specified here is none other than the good king of Judah who, re, who reigned in the days of uh, Isaiah and Micah. This would mean therefore that Zephaniah was not only a prophet, but he was a prince because he was descendant of Hezekiah. Uh, Zephaniah was uh, familiar with the conditions in Jerusalem and he referred to that city in such a way as to make it likely that it was his hometown. He, this is where he uh, grew up. Uh, other than that, there's no information given concerning his occupation or other details of his life. If he was married, had children, things like that. We don't know any of that. We do know that the prophet's ministry was uh, executed during the reign of Josiah, 640 to 609 BC. And the prophecy of this book was likely given during the period just prior to the reforms become, uh, begun by Josiah in 621 BC. His preaching, Zephaniah's preaching, likely served to help bring about these reforms that were led by King, uh, King Josiah. Like uh, other minor prophets, uh, Zephaniah's message included a description of sin and unfaithfulness a call to repentance and a promise of redemption. However, Zephaniah focused on what he referred to as the day of the Lord as judgment more often than others did. And he not only speaks about judgment on the Southern Kingdom, but also on other nations as well as a final universal judgment that is uh, to come. For example, in chapter three, verse eight, he says, therefore wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up as a witness. Indeed, my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out on them my indignation, all my burning anger for all the earth will be devoured by the fire of my zeal. And so Zephaniah talks not only about Judah, the Southern Kingdom, but he talks about a, the general judgment when all nations will be judged uh, by God. As far as the prophet's time, you know, the things that were going on during his uh, life, uh, the good king, Hezekiah, and isn't it that way that we, we kind of, when we're looking at the kings of the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom, we say, well, he was a good king. Well, he was a bad king. Well, so good king Hezekiah, had been followed to the throne by his wicked son, Manasseh. And Manasseh reintroduced idolatry into the land and he set out to undo all the good things that his father had done in the land. 
Amon, who succeeded Manasseh to the throne, followed in his father's wicked steps. His reign was one of great wickedness. And so Manasseh and Amon turned the people away from their God. Now, when Amon was assassinated, his eight year old son came to the throne. This son, Josiah, was the last good king to reign over Judah. At 16, he began to seek after God. At the age of 20, he began to purge the land of the trappings of idolatry. And in the process of having the temple in Jerusalem repaired, a copy of the long lost and forsaken book of the law was found. We read about that in 2 Kings chapter 22. This book was taken to the king and read before him. And upon hearing the teachings and the exhortations of the book of the law, Josiah set about to accomplish an extensive series of religious and social reforms. Idolatrous priests were slain and the purity of worship was restored. Again, uh, 2 Kings chapter uh, Second King chapter two, uh, 22 and 23 talks about that. Also Second Chronicles chapters 34 and 35 tell that story of all the reforms that King Josiah uh, had uh, accomplished uh, in uh, the Southern Kingdom. So Zephaniah's prophecy evidently occurred just prior to these reforms, for he addresses himself to a corrupt and carnal and cruel people. Idolatry was still in the land and the people deserved punishment. And so Josiah had not yet begun the transformation of the Southern Kingdom uh, when Zephaniah comes along and begins preaching and demanding uh, these changes. We read, for example, uh, in chapter three of his book, woe to her who is rebellious and defiled the tyrannical city. She heeded no voice, she accepted no instruction, she did not trust in the Lord, she did not draw near to her God. Her princes within her are roaring lions, her judges are wolves at evening, they leave nothing for the morning. Her prophets are reckless, treacherous men, her priests have profaned the sanctuary, they have done violence uh, to the law. The Lord is righteous within her, he will do no injustice, Every morning he brings his justice to light. He does not fail, but the unjust knows no shame. I have cut off nations. Their corner towers are in ruins. I have made their streets desolate with no one passing by. Their cities are laid waste without a man, without an inhabitant. I said, surely you will revere me, accept instruction. So her dwelling will not be cut off according to all that I have appointed concerning her, but they were eager to corrupt all their deeds. And so Josiah is uh, simply summarizing what has taken place. Uh, God has warned, God has instructed, uh, God has uh, uh, foretold all the things that'll happen uh, to the wickedness of the pe because of the wickedness of the people. But the very last line is indicative of the attitude of the, of the population. It says, but, they were eager to corrupt all their deeds. They just wouldn't listen. They would just continue on in what they were doing. We have the prophet's uh, message uh, broken down. The book of Zephaniah has judgment as its theme. If you're gonna have an exam and <laughs> on the exam, they ask you, uh, what's Zephaniah all about? Well, it's about judgment. It looks to the coming of the day of the Lord. Its pronouncements are clear and unsparing. Judah had been a sinful nation and its day of grace had passed. Doom was in the offing. The Babylonians would strike soon. How soon? 605 BC, the first time that they attacked the Southern Kingdom. And so Zephaniah not only foretells the judgment of his own people, but also speaks about the fate of the surrounding nations. That is also something that is uh, not necessarily unique, but special about his book and his prophecy. So here's the history of destruction of Jerusalem. 
a lot of times we think about it as a single event, but actually it was a series of events that eventually culminated in the final destruction of the city. So let's, uh, let's break it down here. It was a process that took over almost 20 years actually uh, of events. So let's um, kind of break down the events. Uh, there was the, uh, the Battle of Carchemish. In 605 BC, the Babylonians led by Nebuchadnezzar II decisively defeated the Egyptian and the Assyrian forces at the Battle of Carchemish. This victory solidified Babylon's control over, uh, the, uh, over the region. So we have that event. Next is the subjugation of Judah itself. After the Battle of Carchemish, Nebuchadnezzar II turned his attention to Judah. Judah was a vassal state of the Babylonians and its king Jehoiakim had initially been loyal to, uh, to Egypt. Uh, Judah was never in control. It was always being controlled by one power or another because it was in the middle. Uh, to the south was a former world power, Egypt, yet still powerful. To the north were the Assyrians or the Babylonians or the Medes or whatever, uh, you know, world powers uh, to the north. And there's little Judah, you know, stuck in between these two things. And so these great nations uh, many times would march towards uh, Judah uh, to face one another. They were at the crossroads of where all the battles took place. And of course, uh, the, the great nations were anxious to take over uh, the, the territory of Judah and control it in order to be able to launch attacks against each other you know, as a launching point for their military uh, operations. Uh, and so uh, you have um, uh, the Babylonians uh, controlling it for a time and uh, reducing it to a vassal state. What does that mean? It means that uh, they left Judah alone and they, they kind of put in a puppet king, if you wish, uh, Jehoiakim, and made sure that he collected taxes and kept everything you know, calm. And so long as they paid their taxes and they didn't, you know, uh, you know, they didn't uh, cause any trouble, uh, they were kind of left uh, to themselves. Uh, the next uh, event, if you wish, uh, was the first deportation that took place in 605 BC. Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem this time. And during this time, he took select members of the royal family and nobility as captives to Babylon. Among them were, of course, Daniel and his friends, who later became prominent figures in that court. Uh, the next uh, stage, if you wish, was the establishment of Babylonian rule. Following the invasion, Nebuchadnezzar placed Jehoiakim uh, under tribute and Judah became a vassal state under Babylonian control. At one time it was under Egyptian control. Now it was under Babylonian uh, control. The next uh, event is the prophetic context. In other words, the events of this period are prophesied in the Bible, particularly in the books of Daniel and Jeremiah, as well as the book uh, that we're looking at today, Zephaniah. These prophets warned about the impending judgment and exile due to the disobedience of the people of Judah. Again, it didn't happen all in one day, as I'm demonstrating here. It happened over a period of uh, almost 20 years. But during that period, you had the prophets you know, appealing to and, and speaking to the kings and to the people to repent, to change their ways, to trust in God uh, for, uh, uh, for salvation. And it's easy for us to say, well, why didn't they just do that? You know, God had done the miracles and so on and so forth. But uh, if, if you realize how huge you know, Babylon was in those days in the Assyrian Empire and how powerful it was and how tiny Judah was in comparison, you could kind of understand uh, why the, uh, uh, the Jews were more interested in creating alliances and military alliances to protect themselves rather than simply uh, to uh, trust uh, God. Uh, we have uh, later phases of the Babylonian uh, conquest. Uh, the invasion of 605 was just the beginning of Babylon's actions against Judah. Uh, there were subsequent invasions, 
Uh, they occurred in 597 BC and then again in 586 BC, leading to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and the beginning of the Babylonian uh, captivity. And then you have the fall uh, you have the fall of Babylon. Now you've had the fall of Jerusalem and the, you know, they were all carried off into captivity. Then you have the fall of Babylon. The Babylonians were defeated by the Medo-Persians uh, led by Cyrus the Great in 539 uh, uh, BC. The following year in 538 BC, Cyrus released the first wave of exiles, uh, Jewish exiles, led by Zerubbabel and Jeshua uh, to return to Jerusalem 67 years after the original exile. So we've seen these seven steps here, the warnings given to them and the various military uh, aggressions against them. Uh, you see finally uh, the, the, the fall of uh, Jerusalem and then you see the fall of Babylon and after the fall of Babylon, the Persians permit the Jewish exiles to return uh, to their country. And we should uh, note for history's sake that the Persians did not release simply the Jews. They released all the people that were in exile in these nations to return to their former nations, you know, including uh, the, Jewish, uh, the Jewish people. Um, in the first year, uh, 458 BC, uh, a second wave uh, of exiles returned, this time with Ezra. Uh, so almost 100 years later. And then uh, in 445 BC, uh, Nehemiah was sent to rebuild, uh, to rebuild, the, uh, to rebuild the wall. Uh, Zephaniah's book uh, warns about the judgment in the form of the uh, Babylonian invasion of 605. So if you're looking at all these dates, where does Zephaniah fit in? Well, he fits uh, into the slot uh, where he was warning the people about the initial invasion of the Babylonians, which took place in 605. And as I have said, continued you know, over a period of 20 years until the city was finally, uh, dis, uh, finally destroyed. However, the book does not paint a totally black picture. A clear promise of mercy and restoration is set forth. The Lord uh, would have a purified people after the terrible judgment of defeat and captivity at the hands of uh, Babylon. This looked forward to the bringing of a remnant of the people back to the land, as I said, under Zerubbabel and then later under Ezra, and ultimately the establishment of the reign of the Messiah uh, with the coming of uh, Jesus. Remember I told you most Old Testament prophets, not all, but most Old Testament prophets had a, a, a particular cycle, if you wish, um, uh, in which they wrote. Uh, they, would, um, they would talk first about the sins of the people and what they were guilty of, and then they would talk about the judgment of God that, would, that was coming, and then they would make a case for repentance, and then at the end, uh, there would be hope. You know, if you repent, if you do all of this, there'll be times of refreshment, you know, God will save you, and so on and so forth. So Zephaniah uh, is one of these, he, he preaches in that kind of cycle, uh, he uh, says that eventually, uh, with the coming of the Messiah, there'll be a time of, uh, of, uh, of refreshment. This prophecy about the judgment, the exile, and the eventual return from Babylonian captivity spoken of by Jeremiah, you know, the 70 year prophecy, and Zephaniah, which will set up the ministry of Haggai uh, during the return of the exiles in a little less uh, than a century. Okay, so there's some history of the, uh, of the uh, book itself. If we wanna you know, analyze the book, you know, put it into a kind of an outline, uh, it would be the following. Uh, first sec three sections to the book. The first one, the day of the Lord, uh, in chapters uh, one um, uh, to uh, chapter two, verse three. Uh, there's the superscription, God's righteous judgment upon the world, 
upon the entire earth. Uh, he talks about judgment on the entire earth and then about Judah and then about Jerusalem in particular. So his warning is the whole earth, you know, all the nations will be judged, but also Judah will be judged and also Jerusalem specifically uh, will be judged. Uh, sinners of every rank uh, are to be judged as well. Uh, he says that the day of the Lord is near in chapter 1, 14 to 18, and that'll be a terrible time of wrath. There'll be no escape. Uh, and also he makes an appeal of, uh, to men to seek deliverance uh, from God. The second part of this, uh, of the book, is the judgment of the uh, nations. And this is where I said his, um, his book is different than the others. He takes the time uh, to judge all the nations, or his message is not just for the southern kingdom, but he judges the nations around the, uh, the, uh, 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 the southern kingdom. And so in chapter two, we see where he talks about the judgment against all nations, whether they be small nations nearby or great nations that are far off, all nations are going to be judged by God. Um, he mentions the fact that the heathens are going to be punished, not just believers who are unfaithful, but the heathens also will be uh, punished. And then he specifies, woe to the polluted city of Jerusalem, uh, and its rejection of God, uh, this demanded uh, um, a punishment, demanded judgment. And then the very last section is chapter three, verses nine to 20, where he talks about uh, salvation for the remnant. There's the light at the end of the tunnel passage, if you wish. A righteous remnant, he says, will be gathered from among the heathen, a remnant to be cleansed and sanctified, and then Israel at the end, his climax, Israel will be exalted before the whole, uh, before the whole world. And so uh, some of the general messages that we get from uh, Zephaniah's book, uh, the first section of the book announces a universal and consuming judgment against the earth, against Judah, and then against Jerusalem in that order. Without excuse in their sinfulness, these are specifically singled out for wrath. And all of this will come in the day of the Lord. The only hope in that day would be to turn to God in uh, repentance. The second section, chapter two to uh, chapter three, verse eight, makes it clear that no nation would escape judgment in the day of the Lord. So even if uh, some were thinking, uh, well, God is our God, you know, for the Jews. He's only, he only cares about us. You know, uh, Zephaniah corrects that uh, misconception. Uh, God cares about all nations. Even nations who have never worshiped him uh, will, be, will be judged. So he makes it clear that no nation will escape judgment in the day of the Lord. The sins of the heathen and the despicable idolatry of Judah demand that God in his holiness punish uh, those who are guilty of this. The prophet makes it clear that this punishment was not to be viewed as an end in itself, but as a means of bringing men to salvation through chastisement. So again, there's always the element of hope. Yes, you'll be punished. Hopefully you'll be punished so that you will realize that there is a God and that he wants obedience and that you can turn to him and then the third section, chapter three, nine to 20, presents the glory which the penitent and the purified people would receive after the judgment already described. The restoration of the Jews to their land under Zerubbabel and Ezra is envisioned here. But beyond that, the salvation of the messianic era is foreseen. And so at the very end, uh, uh, his passages at the end are messianic prophecy. In other words, they don't only talk about the salvation of the Southern Kingdom. You know, if you repent, God will restore you. He's talking about the time when Jesus will come at the end. So when you reread this and you're reading the end, realize that you're reading messianic prophecy here, prophesying about what will take place when Jesus returns. And of course, as we've done with all the books, lessons for our learning, lessons for us today, 
Lesson one, all men and nations are within the power of God and are accountable to him then as well as now. Even today, nations, including our own nation, can face God's chastisement for its evil. You know, uh, we, we rail against the idea that there's abortion, you know, abortion on demand, uh, where we've gotten to the point now where people are actually uh, uh, active in demanding uh, that abortions be done uh, you know, in the final days of, of pregnancy, even if a child is born and the mother doesn't want it, uh, it's, it'd be legal to, uh, you know, to, uh, to kill that uh, child. Uh, I mean, that's not the only evil in our nation and in other nations, but you know, political corruption, uh, sexual uh, immorality, all kinds of things. You know. uh, the same type of things were happening in heathen nations uh, at that time. So God didn't ignore the corporate sins of nations then, and he doesn't and will not leave unpunished the godlessness and depravity and the arrogance of today's nations. Uh, if you're upset that you see certain nations doing you know, terrible things today, uh, realize that uh, God will judge all the nations. No, no nation will escape uh, being judged for what it has done. So if we take any lesson from Zephaniah, one of them is that all nations are still accountable to God. Uh, another lesson, all nations will be judged. There will be the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, as the term was used in the minor prophets, was that day on which a nation received its just due for sin. These times in history all foreshadow the ultimate day of the Lord when all men will be judged before the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. And we have confirmation of that in the New Testament in Acts 17, for example, it says, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. All people everywhere, what does that mean? Well, all people everywhere, the whole world should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. In other words, uh, there have been many instances of God's judgment coming in various ways, floods, famines, military defeats, economic disasters, uh, referred to as the day of the Lord. You know, uh, the Jews would lose a battle well, the day of the Lord came upon them that day on individual uh, events. However, there will also be a final day of the Lord or final judgment when Jesus returns to judge everyone, the living and the dead, and set into motion an eternity of joy or an eternity of suffering for those who have disobeyed him. The lesson here is that there's no excuse for not being ready. We've seen the example of warnings being fulfilled. We've heard the gospel ourselves and we've been taught to be ready at all times for the master's uh, return. We've even been told that he will come when we least expect him to appear. So there's no excuse. Uh, we need to be ready for the Lord's coming for us in death or his sudden arrival at the, uh, end, of, uh, at the end of the world. And so the core lessons of Zephaniah are related. First, repent if you need to. Uh, and that, that goes for his own people who recognize him as well as those who don't recognize him. Everyone is needing to repent. And then the second lesson, be ready at all times because God's judgment is coming and it will be sure. And you know, someone say, wow, that's not a very popular message. You know? Somebody watching this uh, uh, video will say, wow, that's not, that's not good news. That's not happy-go-lucky uh, Christianity. Well, no, uh, of course not. Uh, the role of the church is to warn the world, uh, well, first of all, to announce to the world uh, that the Messiah has come and his name is Jesus and you can be saved through him. That's one message and, and we do you know, a fairly good job of getting that message out. But there's another equally important message given to the church uh, uh, to tell the world and that is there's a judgment coming. 
and all nations will be judged. Uh, and all nations need to pay attention to that. We don't give that message out. We don't, you know, that's not a family friendly message. That's not a way to, you know, wow, we're not going to have a lot of people joining the church, you know, if that's the message they hear. But, but it's an accurate message and it's one that we, we have to uh, uh, proclaim uh, from time to time. Okay, so that's the, the point of uh, Hezekiah, excuse me, the point of Zephaniah. Uh, his message was one of warning and judgment. Okay, let's move on to the next minor prophet and that would be Haggai. And in doing so, uh, we move on to the three minor prophets who served after the Jews were returned to Jerusalem under Zerubbabel. The first of these was Haggai and uh, his prophecies were given around 516 or 515 BC and directed at Zerubbabel and the people that he led. Uh, so the three are of course uh, Haggai, Zechariah and Malachi. Those are the last three. We're doing Haggai this week and next week we'll finish with the last two, Zechariah and Malachi. Uh, his name, the name Haggai means festival or festival of Jehovah. We know practically, again, nothing about the prophet himself. He's mentioned not only in the book uh, bearing his name, but he's also mentioned in the book of Ezra, chapter five and chapter six. Haggai had been a captive in Babylon and he had returned to his homeland with the remnant under Zerubbabel, the first return, okay? And so he and Zechariah, the other minor uh, uh, prophet, um, were contemporaries and they worked toward the common goal of rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem. And what's interesting about Haggai is that he grew up during the time of the initial return to Jerusalem with the first wave of people freed from exile. So he lived in exile and then was part of the group that came back he, as a boy, came back to Jerusalem. And while they were rebuilding the temple and rebuilding the city and doing all of that, he was a young boy growing up. And then at some point in his life, God called him uh, to ministry to prophesy, okay? Now the ministry of this prophet is easily dated from the first verse of the book. It says the second year of Darius the king. Well, that would have been 520 BC from the four dates uh, given in the book. He gives dates in chapter one, verse one, two, verse one, two, verse 10, and two, verse 20. From these dates, it would appear that his primary work among the people was done in a period of only four months. He's a minor prophet, but his prophecies only cover a period of four months. But as brief as his ministry may have been, it was uh, effective. Let me get this chart up here, there we go. First of all, in verse one uh, of uh, his book, chapter one, verse one, it says, in the second year of Darius the king, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of, uh, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Okay, so note, he says, on the first day of the sixth month, okay? Now, in chapter two, verse one, he says, on the 21st of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai to the prophet saying, and so on and so forth. So in this passage, he says, on the 21st day of the seventh month, okay? So it was the first day of the sixth month, then it was the 21st day of the seventh month, then Number three, chapter two, verse 10, he says, on the 24th of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet saying, so now you've got the 24th day of the ninth month. So you've had the sixth month, the seventh month, the ninth month, okay? And then uh, two, verse 20, then the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month saying, so on and so forth. So you've got two references 
uh, of him receiving a prophecy and speaking it on the same day. Uh, notice uh, he says on the 24th day in the, of the ninth month, in chapter two, verse 10. And then he says on the 24th day of the ninth month, the very same day uh, down in chapter two, verse 20. And then that's it. Those are the four instances of his uh, prophecies and uh, his, uh, his work. So that's what's unusual about Haggai. It's not very long, not, not very long period of time uh, where, he was, uh, where he was called to speak. Uh, as far as uh, his, his timeline uh, is concerned, in undertaking to see this book in its correct historical setting, we need to remember that a full hundred years had passed since the work of Zephaniah. So it was a hundred years later, Haggai begins to speak, begins his mission for Jehovah. Uh, and many important things had happened in that uh, century. Zephaniah had indicated that Judah's day of grace had passed and that Jehovah's judgment was inescapable. This judgment came at the hands of the Babylonians who under Nebuchadnezzar invaded Judah again in 605 BC. An ill-fated revolt against the Babylonians brought an even worse invasion in 586 BC, uh, where Jerusalem was burned, the temple was destroyed, more captives were taken, Daniel and Ezekiel prophesied among the exiles in Babylon and sought to keep hope alive among the people uh, there. After Nebuchadnezzar's death in 562 BC, a series of weak kings followed. The Babylonian empire deteriorated to the point that in 539 BC, King Cyrus of Persia took the city of uh, Babylon. Then Cyrus showed a benevolent attitude toward all exiles, but especially the Jewish exiles in Babylon. And so in 538 BC, he gave the decree allowing them to return to their native land. And as I've mentioned before, you can read about that in 2 Chronicles 36, Ezra uh, 1 for the uh, biblical account of this decree. Then in 536 BC, the first group numbering about 40,000 made the journey home. They were led by Zerubbabel and they began rebuilding the city of Jerusalem. The foundation of the temple was laid, but then because of you know, the tribes around them threatening them, uh, work on the temple was halted and nothing more was done uh, on it until 15 or 16 years later. Why? Well, Haggai uh, rose up and Zechariah rose up and they began their ministries. And as I said, what was interesting is that Haggai and Zechariah, they were part of that 40,000 that had been brought over. And then they grew up watching the people starting to rebuild the temple. And they observed uh, what took place when the uh, you know, surrounding nations threatened the workers and the work stopped for 15 or 16 years. But in the meantime, they're growing up. They're becoming young men. And as they reach you know, young adulthood, God calls them into ministry. And what ministry is that? Well, Haggai, as we're studying now, his ministry is to kind of point out to Zerubbabel, the leader, uh, not to quit building the temple. We'll get to that in a second. So uh, the Jews were obviously dispirited uh, and wretched when these two prophets came along. Jerusalem and the other cities of Judea were in ruins. The walls were torn down. The land had not been worked and thus it was poor and unproductive. People now living in the area were hostile to the return of the Jews. And so the enthusiasm and hope of the early settlers had dissipated because they had abandoned their primary task, which was to rebuild the temple. And, and as a consequence, the other parts of their lives had been negatively affected as well. So both Haggai and Zechariah, who we'll look at next week, had been witnesses to this decline as they grew up during this time period. So what's the message? What was Haggai's message about? Haggai has been described as a man with one single idea. His single message was this, build the temple. That was his message. He attributed the people's lack of, of success in all areas of their lives to the single fact of their indifference to the completion of the house of God. So we read in Haggai chapter one, 
It says, then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies desolate, this house meaning the temple? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, but have harvested little. You eat, but there's not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there's not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns, earns wages to put into a purse with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains, bring wood and rebuild the temple that I may be pleased with it and glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, but behold, it comes to little. When you bring it home, I blow it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house, which lies desolate while each of you runs to his own house. Therefore, because of you, the sky has withheld its dew and the earth has withheld its produce. I called for a drought on the land, on the mountains, on the grain, on the new wine, on the oil, on what the ground produces, on men, on cattle, and on all the labor of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai, the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people showed reverence uh, for the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke by the commission of the Lord to the people saying, I am with you, declares uh, the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, uh, their God. On the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year, of Darius the king. So note that the leader and the people responded to Haggai's preaching in less than a month. He preached on the first of the sixth month and then it says on the 24th of the sixth month, the people responded. They got to work, they got busy again. I, 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 I envy this after many years of preaching, I sure would love to have a, a response to my exhortations in, in two weeks. But anyways, uh, Haggai uh, had a good run there. His book, an analysis of his book, if we want to take a look at that very quickly, the book of Haggai may be outlined as follows. Uh, the first message, uh, chapter one, verses one to 15, uh, is a rebuke for neglecting the temple. He talks about his, himself as a prophet and his commission, the selfish indifference of the people, the curse resulting from their attitude, God's displeasure with them, and the response of the people uh, themselves. The second message, glory of the new temple. In other words, God's blessing to abide with the builders and the glory of the new temple to exceed that of the former temple. The third message is the condition of future prosperity. The present uncleanness of the people. Uh, two questions about uncleanness and the application of this to the people themselves and the necessity of a change of heart would result in a change in their material circumstances. You know, that, that long passage I read, that's exactly what it, what it is, right? God is saying, how are things? How are things going? You know, uh, how, how are you doing with that? I'm not building the temple. I'm taking care of my own house first. How's that working for you? That's it. How's that working for you? You know, you, you work hard, but you don't have any money. You know, you grow grapes, but you have nothing to drink. You grow wheat and it dies in the field. How's that working for you? So uh, Haggai, uh, his message, uh, his uh, third message is uh, how glorious it will be if you obey the Lord, you'll see that things will change. And then his fourth and final message, he speaks of a glorious future. Uh, the surrounding nations will be overthrown, the promise of Messiah uh, to be confirmed through the preservation of Zerubbabel. In other words, as Zerubbabel is preserved from attack and death you know, by others, by enemies, you, uh, you will note God's uh, uh, presence among you, uh, that God is taking care of your, of your leader. This will be the proof that God is not only with your leader, but he is also with the nation. Okay, um, Haggai's message had a purpose to it, several purposes, go through these. The first message brought about a stinging rebuke to the people for building their own houses 
and looking to establish their material prosperity before looking to their spiritual obligations. Unless God's work is put first in one's life, everything else to which he puts his hand will eventually fail him. The people were brought to repentance by this straightforward challenge. In other words, Haggai didn't mince any words. You people were supposed to come here and rebuild the temple and instead you rebuilt your houses and, and that's wrong. That's why you're failing. The second message uh, was designed to encourage the builders who had undertaken the task of rebuilding the temple. They were assured that God was with them in their work. Don't be afraid, God is with you. The third message was designed to teach the people that their sacrifices and their external rituals would be in vain if they did not purify their hearts. As surely as their impure hearts and disobedient lives had brought curses in the past, pure hearts and obedient lives would bring blessings in the future. And then the fourth and final message is a messianic prophecy. So there's messianic prophecy in Zephaniah and there's also messianic prophecy in the book of Haggai. Zerubbabel, the first ruler of restored Israel and a descendant of David is allowed to be the symbol of the messianic line. God had not forgotten his promise to bring the Messiah through his own people. Uh, so what Haggai is doing, he, he's, he finishes by giving them a, the big picture. He's saying to them, here's the big picture. You are God's people. Even though you're a small remnant, you are God's people. And he reminds them of the promise that God was going to bring the Messiah, the savior of the world through his people. Even though his people had been reduced to this tiny group here, vulnerable and uh, you know, surrounded by enemies, it didn't matter. God was going to fulfill that promise that he had made long ago to uh, Abraham. And so uh, uh, Haggai finishes with this particular uh, promise and uh, vision of, um, of, the, uh, of the future. Um, uh, a, couple of, a couple of more things here. I know we're going a little long. Um, there's something unique about Haggai's preaching. Uh, Haggai's preaching is unique among the prophets, primarily because of its focus on a specific practical task. <clears throat> and that was the rebuilding of the temple. Here are some aspects of Haggai's preaching that makes it different from the messages of other prophets. Even though he only you know, preached for four months and he was a very young man, uh, he, very, very interesting uh, what he uh, did. I mean, his preaching. First of all, it was practical. While many prophets delivered messages of judgment and repentance and spiritual renewal, Haggai's primary concern was the physical rebuilding of the temple. So his preaching was focused on motivating and encouraging the people to prioritize a particular task. Okay, so you, 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 you didn't have to wonder what he was talking about. You knew what he was talking about. Secondly, the historical context. Haggai's messages were delivered during a specific historical period, and that is the early Persian period after the return of the Jewish exiles from uh, Babylon. His preaching addressed the challenges and opportunities faced by the community at that time. In other words, you can pinpoint historically when he lived and when he preached. The third thing is the directness and clarity. You cannot miss the point of his preaching. You don't have to take a special course to understand what his preaching is about. Very direct, very clear. Uh, the, uh, the effect of the immediate response. Uh, Jeremiah would have loved to have the results that Haggai had. Uh, Jeremiah preached for his whole life and didn't make a single convert. Uh, how many prophets were pre, Isaiah, you know, uh, uh, Ezekiel, how many prophets uh, uh, had more beautiful language and lofty ideas, spiritual and theological ideas, yeah, but the nation didn't pay attention. They didn't obey. And yet here comes Haggai and within two weeks, uh, you know, the nation repented and did exactly what uh, was asked of them. So that is rare in, uh, in uh, uh, prophetic uh, preaching. 
Also, encouragement and hope. While Haggai's preaching contains elements of rebuke and admonition, uh, it also offers words of encouragement and hope. He assures the people of God's presence and promises of blessings. And then finally, his divine authority. Haggai's preaching carries the weight of divine authority. He speaks as the mouthpiece of God, conveying God's will, and, and he doesn't make excuses uh, for it. All right, one last thing, and that is, there's only one lesson. You know, when I say life lessons from Haggai, there's only one last, there's only one lesson that you can get from his preaching. There's a connection between faithfulness and blessings. That's it, that's the only lesson. I'm not saying that if you're faithful, you'll be rich, healthy, never have any problems. We all know that the opposite is often true for those who make a great effort to remain faithful. The blessings of faithfulness are not necessarily physical in nature. They can be, and they often are, but the sure blessings of faithfulness are the following. First, assurance. We have confidence that we are doing God's will and he is pleased with us. We have confidence in our salvation because Jesus promises that those who are faithful to the end will be saved. Matthew 24, 13, faithful to the end. If I'm on my deathbed at some point, I'll want someone to read to me Matthew 24, 13, that those who are faithful to the end will be saved. That's, that's the reward of faithfulness. And then, of course, peace. Those who are faithful experience the peace that surpasses understanding, which means that our peace of mind is not based on human reasoning or meditation or wealth, but rather it's a gift of God. We also, those who are faithful, uh, have spiritual vision and insight only the faithful can hear God and see God as the Holy Spirit reveals him through his word. Non-believers and the unfaithful, they see only this world and this life and the rewards of this world and this life. And then finally, faithfulness gives birth and nourishes hope. We can bear hardship, we can avoid the seduction of wealth in this world because we have a secure hope for another life that comes with Christ, Romans 15, 13. So Haggai's preaching affirms this truth that God is faithful in his promise to bless us if we remain faithful. But remember, bless us not necessarily with physical things, but bless us with a vision and peace of mind and understanding, those kinds of blessings. Sometimes these blessings are material, sometimes they're spiritual, and many times they're both. The key to building our ability to be faithful is to continually make spiritual matters a priority in our lives. This is how we exercise our faith muscle. We make, we make things that belong to the Lord a priority in our, in our lives. Okay, that's our lesson for today. The assignment's pretty straightforward. Let's go back, reread Zephaniah and Haggai, hopefully now It'll have more meaning as you have some background material. And go ahead and read the final two books, uh, Zechariah and Malachi. And if the Lord is willing, uh, we will wrap up the minor prophets study next week or next time uh, when we do these final prophets. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it.